Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the effective risk management strategies in outpatient methadone treatment, part one of three sessions. I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Taylor, who is um, the presenter today. Dr. Taylor, just click on that box, and we will see your screen. Okay. Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we do have a full agenda this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be presenting the first series, and it consists of three modules for the first uh, series of trainings. Um, I would request, if you can, to hold your questions to the end. Uh, that way, I believe we can stay on track and uh, I can complete presenting the information. Uh, so we're going to begin by uh, posing the question in terms of risk management for opioid treatment programs. What's going on out there? Before I begin, I, w I need to uh, pay respect to a devoted colleague, uh, Lisa Moya Torres, JD, who passed away, unfortunately, uh, in April of 2011. She had a prolonged struggle with ovarian cancer. Um, Lisa was uh, a friend, colleague, and a unique individual. Lisa was an attorney. She graduated from Boston University and New York uh, University School of Law. She specialized in an area uh, called civil rights uh, and health care law. She was an advocate uh, for patients uh, with addiction uh, problems and in recovery. Uh, she was the founding chairperson of Faces, uh, Voices, Faces and Voices of Recovery. Uh, most, and she was well known to people in the field. Uh, Lisa was a recipient of the Distinguished nice, nice Wander Dole Award um, given by the American Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence, ATOD, and she received that in October of 2010 at our last conference in Ch Chicago, Illinois. So I want to pay respect to Lisa because she worked avidly on this material when we first began, I believe, back in 2000. And some of the material that I'm presenting today is uh, Lisa's work, and I just want to um, say that we surely miss her. Secondly, I want to acknowledge some of the previous um, faculty members who developed many of these, um, uh, much of this material that I'm presenting today and in the upcoming series. Uh, Rich Willis, um, uh, who was program director for the uh, NMS Insurance Group, located here in Pennsylvania. Todd Mandel, who is a psychiatrist um, and uh, is practicing and working in the field of methadone treatment in Vermont. Uh, Anthony Style, a, another psychiatrist in Pennsylvania, and Dr. Alan Wartenberg in Rhode Island. And also um, a relatively new faculty member, Eileen Robeck, who um, is a pain management physician in Florida. And I believe in the last module we will be, or a series rather, we will be uh, presenting some of the material that she was very helpful uh, in developing. And lastly, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Mike uh, Flaherty, who was the um, past executive director of IRETA, who helped uh, with the organization of some of this original work. So let's move forward now, and let's look at the big picture. What do I mean by this? Um, I'm going to Throughout this series, we're going to present a lot of uh, information, but I think we need to start out with uh, the big picture. You know, why are we talking about this? What is the significance of this? First, let's start out by talking about, or at least paying some um, attention to, what are the primary indications for the use of opioid medications? Principally two areas, in pain management, and here we're talking about moderate to severe pain, uh, acute. It depends on how you want to categorize pain. It can also be categorized in terms of acute or chronic pain. Uh, another way of looking at pain, is it related to cancer or terminal disease, or is it non-malignant pain? So opioids are indicated for all of these areas. And lastly, in relevance to our topic today, it's um, indicated for the use or treatment of patients who have problems with illicit and prescription 
uh, medication. Let's look at the uh, broad class of opioid analgesics, and I put in here parentheses morphine uh, because, you know, morphine is the prototype drug in a sense, and when you talk about uh, consumption, uh, many of the statistics and studies that you will look at will use morphine as an indicator. The global consumption overall of opioid analgesics, including um, morphine, statistics show that it has dramatically increased over the past two decades or 20 years or more. However, in many developing countries, pain management is poorly addressed, and it's estimated that over 80% of the world's population is not adequately treated for moderate or severe pain although we have the capacity and the science to do that. And what we're talking about in these developing, um, in these developing countries is people who suffer with HIV AIDS. It's estimated that um, there are over a million uh, patients who have end-stage development. Um, as you can see here, patients with terminal cancer, about five and a half million, uh, about uh, 0.8 million just related to injuries and accidents and violence, and you have patients who have chronic illnesses, patients recovering from surgery, women in labor, you can see it's, it's a serious problem worldwide. Now, I'm going to pose a question and I'll give you a few moments just to think about this answer. Now, what would you estimate as the percentage representing the proportion of the United States worldwide consumption of, of opioids. In other words, in terms of the overall percentage, what would you estimate? 20%, 30%, 60%, 80%? Well, if you selected your answer, if you selected 80%, you would be correct. The United States represents about 4.6% of the world's population. However, we use or consume in this country over 80, oh, let me go back, 80 percent of the world's um, consumption of opioids. And in fact, you, you remember, the United States is considered a developed country. It's estimated that in terms of the overall um, world population, 6 percent, that includes the other developed countries, consume about, again, about 80 percent of the world's uh, use of opioids. So there's a disproportionate use uh, in, in terms of, you know, the amount of people that we have in these developed countries versus the undeveloped countries. Okay, so now where does this what I call big picture lead us. Well, it leads us, particularly here in the United States, it leads us to this issue of what is being recognized as an epidemic in prescription drug abuse. The commonly abused drugs are opioid pain relievers and central nervous system depressants such as the benzodiazepines or sedative hypnotic medications and also stimulants. This has led um, the government uh, from, to consider what we call a comprehensive plan of action and developing uh, new requirements involving the Office of National Drug Control, ONDCP, many federal agencies, as you see listed here, Health and Human Services, SAMHSA, uh, CSAT, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the FDA and the uh, DEA. There is a concerted effort to um, address uh, this issue of, of the national epidemic that we have of prescription drug abuse. Uh, by what I mean by federal uh, requirement, there is a concerted effort to educate the medical community about prescribing practices and uh, related issues. This epidemic as you uh, may be aware, it's been in the news um, involving celebrities with addiction problems and the meat and their significant um, media involvement. So this is what I mean by where does this lead us to, particularly in regard to our topic today. There is a spotlight on this issue of 
uh, prescription drug abuse. But we need to get down to the details specifically uh, related to our topic with risk prevention, uh, or risk management, and prevention efforts that involve opioid treatment programs. So how does this relate to OTPs? Well, methadone is in a what I call conundrum or challenge in that there's a lot of attention being focused on methadone specifically as one of the medications in the class of opioids. And this is related to this problem of methadone-associated uh, mortality. Methadone-associated deaths, it's been noted that there have been increasing reports uh, in the U.S. Uh, involving methadone-related deaths since, uh, deaths rather, since uh, 2002. And since that time, SAMHSA convened the first methadone mortality working group in 2003. There are published um, reports uh, from, these, uh, from that meeting and that work group. And essentially what the report showed that the OTPs were not primarily responsible for the reports of methadone-associated uh, mortality or death. Uh, the report indicated that the use of methadone to treat pain was markedly increased through the distribution of pharmacy channels in the United States. So uh, what we're saying here is that it, through, these, uh, through this analysis, it was determined that it really wasn't the OTPs that uh, were involved, but it was more related to practices involving pain management. SAMHSA uh, subsequently convened two national meetings, and a second report was uh, published in 2007. And the findings were sim uh, similar to the original report in 2003, essentially saying that the problem here with these methadone-associated deaths, is these increases, is more related to pain management. Uh, and there are two reports here uh, that I've listed from the Department of Justice, uh, methadone diversion and misuse and abuse in 2007, increasing at a uh, death rate, uh, death increasing at alarming uh, rates. And then also another report by the GEAO, the Government Accounting Accountability Office in 2009, that again pretty much said the uh, same thing. And then lastly, in 2010, uh, there was a reassessment um, that was done uh, in terms of the methadone mortality report. And uh, this took place in Washington uh, in July. Uh, and I think the final um, recommendations or guidelines from that meeting will be published. But nonetheless, I'll present some of the data that was presented at that meeting. Uh, you should also know that uh, the DEA has been a federal uh, partner in this issue of methadone uh, mortality um, and the reports. And there was a concerted effort involving the pharmaceutical companies uh, to restrict the use of the 40 milligram, milligram, what we call dispersable tablet that was, um, through their analysis, revealed being diverted um, to a lot of uh, areas and uh, circumstances um, for misuse. Uh, and it was restricted to, as, as of January 8th, they restricted this, the sales of these drugs uh, to hospitals and to opioid treatment programs uh, with authorization. So in other words, they changed you know, the channel of distribution of these 40 milligram dispersible tablets, which were highly valuable you know, um, in the illicit market. Now going back to some of the findings from that mortality uh, meeting, uh, the reassessment in 2010 uh, in Washington, the Many of the uh, participants were listed here, uh, SAMHSA, the DEA, um, the FDA, NIDA, and the Indian Health Service. What I'm going to present here is some data that was done from a review of the mortality reports. Um, since 2008, SAMHSA has this voluntary initiative of collecting mortality data. Uh, and originally, you had to send or fax the form the SAMHSA is now online, and all OTPs 
uh, should be participating in this voluntary effort to track uh, mortality that is actually happening in the o opioid treatment program. Um, Jane Maxwell uh, from, I believe, Austin, Texas, a PhD, uh, did some analysis or research on uh, a collection of data that had been submitted to SAMHSA as of 2009. There was a total of about 406 uh, patients that were reported who died while in an opioid treatment program. And from this analysis, it was determined that 27% of the overdose deaths occurred within the first two weeks of treatment. 32% of the overdose deaths involved benzodiazepines mentioned in the report. In terms of the demographics of this population of patients, 67% were male. The average age was between was uh, actually 49.8, but it ranged, as you can see, from 18 years to 88. And the average length of stay of treatment in the opioid program was about four and a half years. You see, you can see one patient was there as long as uh, 38 years. Or not one, but, you know, there were some patients as long as that. And the average number of take-home uh, privileges or bottles uh, that the patient had uh, was five. Uh, and it ranged up to, you know, the maximum of 29 to 30. Now let's look at the average dose for these patients who had died. It was around 91 or 92 milligrams, but it ranged from 10 to 270 milligrams. In terms of other diseases, there was a distribution, as you can see here. There was a significant number that had what we call co-occurring disorders, uh, mental, di uh, mental disorders, uh, spe specifically uh, major depression and anxiety are indicated here. And as I pointed out, 22% um, had a prescription for uh, benzodiazepines, 50% uh, for other antidepressants, particularly the SRIs you can see as noted. Also note here there was this one of almost one-third of the population had liver disease, chronic liver disease, um, identified further in terms of who had hepatitis in this population. 19% were diagnosed with hepatitis C, and you can see some of the other major indicators of disease or morbidity and possibly mortality in this population are chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, metabolic diseases, hypertension, and you can see the distribution. So what was summarized in terms of these findings, now bear in mind this was a small group, only about 406, but nonetheless that's what was reported in 2009, you know, it's hoped that with more participation of programs reporting all deaths, that the numbers will, or the data will increase and we'll be able to uh, get more information. But there were two trends that were, or categories of death that were noted. Older patients with long treatment durations dying of illnesses such as liver disease, cardiovascular disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then you, on the other hand, you had younger patients who died of trauma, overdose, motor vehicle accident, homicide, and suicide. There was recommended that we need to monitor potential toxicities of methadone-associated, uh, uh, tox uh, potentially toxicities between methadone and benzodiazepines. And then also it was recommended that we need to um, have better data to understand suicide and overdose deaths in, this, uh, in our patients in opioid treatment programs. And lastly, it was pointed out that we need to educate families better about overdose symptoms. It's not uncommon for um, a patient in an opioid treatment program who uh, appears to be over-medicated or has the potential for overdose to be told to go home and sleep it off. Uh, that should not take place because that is a harbinger of a possible uh, overdose or a potential overdose uh, because the patient is already displaying signs of being sedated and the patient uh, may, um, you know, die from a what we call respiratory depression. So we need to really educate families about symptoms of overdose and what to do because 
in some of these reports that uh, were uh, submitted, it was indicated that there were warning signs and um, the, the appropriate action did not take place. Now, going back to what I call the big picture, we want to, um, again, uh, focus on uh, some of the details here. Let's look at some of the data related to this epidemic that we have, uh, prescription opioid deaths. Uh, let's look at some data from um, uh, the vital statistics here from the National Institute of Health uh, Statistics, the number of Poisoning deaths involving opioid analgesics and other drugs or substances, you can see the period here is uh, 1999 to, uh, to 20, uh, 2007. And what is very striking is if you look at this curve here, any opioid analgesic, and this is a very broad category and it does include uh, methadone as well, uh, but if you look at these lines here, uh, you can see that the slope here is steep. It's steepest for this particular one. You can see that it does rise. Now, they all rise, so to speak, but this is dramatic. Any opioid, when you compare uh, other drugs and other than opioid analgesics and non-specified drugs and other substances. So th that's the take-home point from this slide. You can see the dramatic increase. This is what we're talking about. From 1999 to 2007, the last... Uh, reportable, or at least this is the last time that they had data that was available. This is ongoing, and there's further uh, information that is being collected and, and coordinated. Again, looking at the number of poisoning deaths from a different perspective, percentage involving opioids, uh, again, looking at it a little different to show you here. Again, you can see, I just want to point out, you can see, if you compare this, the steep of this, this is more dramatic than these other categories, which are somewhat similar in terms of the height of the bars, driving home the point that there's significant of any opioid. This is the greatest category here. Now here's a graph that shows specifically methadone uh, compared. Uh, looking at poisoning deaths again, um, involving methadone more rapidly than other opioid analgesics, cocaine, and heroin. And again, looking at the graph, you can see methadone. And again, the point here is that the slope is very steep. If we look at the rate of what we call opioid pain relievers, over overdose deaths, comparing to treatment admissions and kilograms, uh, these drugs sold, uh, you can see here's uh, deaths per 100,000, and this is what this curve represents. Here we're looking at comparing it with treatment admissions. This, again, looking at uh, 10,000 per 10,000, you can see that there's the phenomena of both of these trends increasing. Okay. And lastly here, um, looking more in terms of more than one, what were uh, the trends in terms of the majority of poisoning deaths involving more than one drug? Because in many poisoning deaths, it's not just one drug. There are multiple drugs involved. And um, you can see that benzodiaz when there was more than one drug uh, specified, benzodiazepines was a significant uh, contributor benzodiazepines with opioid, with uh, cocaine or heroin in addition, and then looking at cocaine or heroin, you can see the, the distribution. Let's compare age groups. I think the significance of this side, slide here is that it shows during this period that people in what we call their prime or the most productive years uh, of their lives are in this category, the last between the ages of 35 to 54, and we're talking about these two upper lines here. Um, they had higher poisoning death rates compared to the other groups, you know, younger and so to speak. So again, this captures people in the prime uh, of their life.
if you look at just one isolated year, again, looking at data that we have available that's presently, um, you know, existing, 2008, there was a total of what we call 36,450 deaths from drug overdoses. Now, it's been reported that the national rate is about 12 per uh, 100,000 people. And this was, again, a significant rise uh, from previous years of in the 1990s. Now let's look at um, states that we would consider greater than the national average of about 11.9, about 12, involving these drug overdose deaths. Now what this represents is about 24, I believe, no, 27 states that are in what we call the top category over than, greater than the, the national rate of about 12. And you can see some of the states that are listed here, New Mexico, uh, West Virginia, Nevada, and, and the list goes on. And, you know, you can look at your area and figure out, uh, you know, where you fit in terms of this category. This graph gives you a pictorial representation of some of the same information, but you can see the states in terms of the category of age-adjusted death rates greater than uh, or per, per 100,000. If you look at the states that are in black and blue, you can get a geographic picture of where these states are and some of the regions where the highest death rates are. And surprisingly, it's not in some of the areas where, you know, the population is the greatest. Again, looking at in terms of well, where are these drugs sold, so to speak, opioid pain relievers, uh, prescription drugs, you can see the trend in terms of well, where are the top states where these drugs uh, are being sold. You can see the distribution. Focus your attention on the black and the blue states. Now let's take a closer look at a state that's been uh, in, uh, that's had a lot of attention, so to speak, in terms of this area because it's had one of the highest uh, rates. You remember, I think it was second on this list, what, uh, West Virginia. Um, there are patterns of, patterns of abuse uh, for un unintentional, what we call overdose uh, fatalities that were looked at in 2006. Uh, this study analyzed the distribution and some of the characteristics. Um, and you, if you can remember, try and compare this with some of the data that I presented from the mortality report uh, from 2010, the reassessment by SAMHSA. Again, an overwhelming majority of these patients are men, 57%. Again, people in their prime, 18 to 54, it was 91, 92%. Um, according to uh, the records that they kept, 63% were associated with diversion. In other words, this was non-medical use. This is not use intended for uh, treatment of pain or, you know, uh, opioid. This was definitely related to diversion. And another characteristic uh, of this population that they studied is that 22% um, almost were associated with doctor shopping. And they define doctor shopping as um, having um, a prescription for a controlled substance from at least five or more cl clinicians in the year prior to their death. So that's how they divide, uh, define um, doctor shopping because you might consider, you know, how do they define that this is going from doctor to doctor where their criteria were strict. You had to have five prescriptions for controlled substances uh, um, within the year uh, prior to your death. At least they had a record through prescription monitoring programs or some kind of database where they could actually trace where these prescriptions were coming from. And then also, as we have, uh, as I've been indicating, about 90, 80% uh, rather had multiple substances contributing to uh, their fatal uh, overdose. Now, I want to draw your attention to one, another state that has um, been noted to have uh, some issues with uh, prescription drug overdose deaths, and New Mexico is ranked in the top three of these states uh, involved in drug-induced deaths. Most of these deaths are the results of, again, unintentional or poisoning deaths 
Um, and again, some of the drugs that we're, we're talking about are methadone, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. This is a report, I don't have the actual statistics in terms of the number, but this is a report on some deaths. They looked at the data of these drug-induced deaths, and in this population, the vast majority of their patients were either Hispanic or white, and their age was uh, at least 43 years of age, and they lived in certain regions in uh, New Mexico, as you can see listed here. They identified risk factors for these deaths uh, upon analysis. Are they obviously, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious, but many of them did have a history of uh, substance use disorders. They had a pattern of using alone. Uh, they had a record of a previous drug overdose, and the majority were injection drug users, and they were mixing drugs uh, with uh, illicit drugs and prescription drugs together. Again, uh, a male population and patients who had uh, disorders such as chronic pain and were being treated with uh, prescription opioids. Lastly, in terms of this big picture, we want to talk about what is recognized as Generation X, Rx rather speak. This is um, our teen population, um, and the significance here is that and here's a quote you can see from Drug Free America. Today's teens are more likely to have abused a prescription painkiller to get high than they are to experience or use uh, a variety of illicit drugs such as ecstasy, cocaine, heroin, and crack and LSD. And they're called uh, Generation RX. Uh, and they have arrived. And it's not uncommon for uh, our teens today to consider these drugs, the prescription drugs, technically, quote, safer than illicit drugs. So they have a propensity uh, to use these drugs. And as the um, report states here, one in five teens has abused Vicodin. One in 10 has used oxycodone or oxycontin. And you can see the statistics here for Ritalin, Adderall, um, and over-the-counter uh, cough medicines, all to induce euphoria. Uh, or to get high. Um, some of the things that have been noted from this study is that what these teen, teens are stating is that these drugs are easy to get to. Um, it's easy to get access to these drugs from parents and friends and families. They're right in the medicine cabinet. So they don't have to necessarily go out into the street and cop or score because they're right there. So part of this educational campaign is directed towards uh, addressing this issue that this is why these drugs are commonly, uh, why we have this epidemic. It's because the access and availability of these drugs. Now, let's go back to somewhat what we call the big picture here, and let's look at what's going on out there from what we call the unique perspective of insurance and opioid treatment programs. But we need to take a closer look here because there's a, a lot uh, that you need to know. In terms of um, insurance uh, uh, and insurance policies, uh, we need to look at the overall issue here. Uh, opioid treatment programs have what we call liability insurance uh, for the program and for all of the staff. And depending upon how the program is structured, um, you know, physicians uh, are a part of that, or they may be independent contractors and have their own uh, professional liability or medical malpractice coverage. So insurance, uh, you know, policies and issues related to insurance is, is part of this picture. The insurance industry and insurers are become very concerned about what we call adverse drug claims in and that's a typo, uh, opioid treatment program. Uh, and generally, there's two aspects that are bringing uh, what we call increased scrutiny to these OTPs, and that's primarily related to the significant increase in the overall number of what we call methadone-related deaths, uh, and also these deaths related to uh, pain clinics. 
And then also we have this problem of public information, news articles, the media uh, has become increasingly negative about opioid treatment programs, methadone, you know, and the safety uh, of this medication. Now, what are some of the overriding trends involving these claims for what we call adverse drug events? Well, there's two issues. Uh, the increased frequency of reported incidents in these uh, claims and increased severity of what we call outcome uh, or settlement. And I'm going to go into uh, a little detail on this. What do we mean by reduced stigma? Well, actually, families are more willing, and um, people who are related to uh, the decedent, so to speak, are more willing to come forth and file a claim. Um, there is this reduced stigma of, of, you know, following an actual claim, you know, related to uh, an adverse event or uh, a wrongful death involving methadone. And these claims often lead to uh, litigation. Secondly, there's greater availability of what we call information. Again, going back to this issue of methadone being in the news and being looked upon in a negative uh, fashion. And this contributes to uh, this information. You know, people will, are willing to talk about it. There's more attorney involvement. Um, you know, I'm, I don't have anything against the legal profession, but, you know, attorneys need work and they're willing to take these cases on. And um, what's been noted uh, here is that there's new causes of action. What I mean by that, as it's been noted that in the last maybe five to ten years, uh, compared to previous claims, and this is stated by the insurance industry related to opioid treatment programs, they're seeing more cases of patients uh, or issues involving what we call impaired drivers, and more recently seeing uh, claims related to cardiac issues, which has been, you know, a hot topic uh, recently related to, and presently still is, in terms of opioid treatment programs and methadone. In terms of severity, again, um, there's more attorney, uh, attorney involvement, and actually this uh, drives the cost up because of uh, more involvement. Uh, there's greater avail availability of information, again, um, and this provides the attorneys with uh, better ability to file claims and to, uh, to sue. Now, and lastly, the uh, demographic shift here, uh, the number of patients taking uh, opioids, as we pointed out, prescription drugs has increased. And overall, this, increased, this has increased the number of patients who have addiction problems. And supposedly, it's been increased to the point that this has an economic impact in, upon the, what we call valuing the uh, life of the uh, decedent. Uh, by insurance, they, insurance agencies, they have a mechanism or a formula in which they determine well, what's the value of the loss of this person's life at, say, in their 30s or 40s or in their prime compared to an older person. So this makes the claim much more expensive. Now, the insurance uh, market is very much like the credit market. Um, insurance pricing and availability has a cyclical uh, swing uh, based on the level of capital uh, and so and surplus. Uh, you know, based on the ability to um, pay a claim. Essentially, you know, insurance companies uh, have a large pool of capital. It's been estimated that. You know, um, the insurance industry pays billions and billions of dollars in claims nationally. So what this does, it has, it, it goes through a cycle. You know, when the surplus is depleted, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the supplies, this causes an overall um, increase in, in uh, claims 
and lost and uh, when versus what is collected. So you have this cycle based on you know what's available in terms of capital and what the claims are and the loss and what the premiums. So there's this vicious well it's not vicious but there's a cycle um, that influences you know the, uh, what the cost of a premium will be. And then also, if there is any catastrophic event, this also influences uh, the cycle. I have a graph here that I think uh, subsequently will explain what we call a hard market and a soft market. Hard markets are characterized by periods when there is what we call decreased competition among carriers uh, and your rates are typically higher. Um, there's more stringent or worse uh, curves. Um, of coverage in terms of conditions, in other words, it's very narrow uh, in terms of it being uh, very broad in terms of what you're protected from. And then when you have a soft market, there's increased competition among your insurance carriers, your rates are lower. You have better coverage and broader terms and conditions. And here's a graph that shows from the early 70s up into uh, presently in the 2000s, and you can see we're somewhere in this area, but the trend is going up. You can see that there were three very what we call hard market cycles, and since 2002 we've been in, uh, you've come down, it's dramatically increased in terms of where we're going, and we are in what we call a soft market period. So what this is saying is that things are relatively good in terms of pricing of premiums, um, there's you know increased competition. Premiums are relatively low, and the terms are you know relatively good. But there are other factors that we need to consider here. Opioid treatment programs, in terms of insurance risk, are considered subprime. Well, what does this mean? It means that you know there are other factors that may influence whether we're, you know, what your premium will be uh, based on this, what we call increased severity and frequency of trends. And it could be offset when, you know, a market is in, uh, when we're in a, what we call a soft market. Now what's leading to this labeling of opioid treatment programs um, being considered subprime? One of the things is, uh, what we call the standards of care. There's actually ambiguity in terms of the practices. Well, what's the standard of care for, you know, an issue related to medication management in particular? Um, and there's ambiguity in terms of, you know, is it regional? Is it by state? Uh, because there is wide variation and there's ambiguity. A set, second issue is that uh, in terms of uh, defense is being challenged. Uh, methadone is often referred to, referred to as what we call a smoking gun because it lasts in the body so long. And medical examiner reports often list methadone as the cause of death, but there are also uh, multiple substances that are can be abused and used. But the spotlight is on methadone if it's listed on the, as the cause of death. And then lastly, again, um, what's influencing this um, subprime labeling um, is the public's image of methadone it, itself, as I've uh, alluded to previously. You should note, in terms of claims trends with opioid treatment programs, um, and this is reported by, you know, my distinguished colleague Rich Willett, who's uh, the program director for NMS Insurance Group, says that most claims are settled out of court. Uh, most claims involving methadone uh, wrongful deaths actually do not go to court uh, because very few. Uh, uh, what's happening is that in the cases that do go, that the treatment, I mean, the outcomes have not been favorable you know, for uh, the opioid treatment program, and so that uh, it's better to settle out of court than to risk a, a jury trial and to have a, an unfavorable uh, verdict. Uh, 
Yeah. Now, well, the picture is not as bleak as it may be. What is an opioid treatment program to do? Well, obviously, if you need to implement a sound risk management program or strategy. Uh, as an individual opioid treatment program, you don't have any control over the insurance market. But what you do have control over in terms of loss is um, your own program, and uh, it's important to have uh, an individualized risk management program. And in developing this, and we're going to go into uh, quite some detail about this uh, subsequently today and in the next um, series, I believe on the 30th, about risk management strategies. Um, and when you have this in place, you're more attractive to your insurance carrier and you're more than likely to have better pricing. And remember, um, right now you're in a soft market, so to speak, so there's competition. You can, um, you know, shop for a better premium. Uh, and again, if you position yourself properly, um, uh, you can improve your track loss by making sure that, you know, you have a, an effective risk management uh, program. And as Rich says, it's not complicated. Um, and here's an approach that states that it really does involve uh, a three-step process. You need to identify your risk, develop strategies to lessen or mitigate these risks, and then monitor your strategy for effectiveness. It's a continuous process. You can't just identify and have strategies and, and you know, without an ongoing process. And we're going to go into some detail about um, how you implement that and how you can control your risk to minimize your loss. In terms of health care, um, from the insurance standpoint, as is stated here in bold, providing quality care. You really need to focus upon is your care that your clinic is providing based on best practice? Is it quality? Um, it's the most effective way to manage your liability exposure. And Rich talked about the four C's of risk management, uh, the four tenets. And the first is current, staying current. What do we mean by this? It's important that your appropriate staff are current in terms of the scientific information and clinical information about methadone and methadone and, and treatment in a, an opioid treatment program and that it's based upon what we call best practice and evidence-based treatment. The second C is to collect. What do we mean by that? Collect patient information before or at the time of admission, what he really means here, and during treatment. We're going to talk about that. Assessment is continuous. You don't just do an intake and start an admission and collect data. Selecting appropriate data related to the patient's treatment is a continuous process and making the needs to be thorough. Communicate with patients through a variety of, of methods and instruments. What is listed here is like the informed consent. We're going to talk more about that. But also to family members, significant others. And lastly, most important uh, here, other health care providers. Uh, one of the goals of uh, electronic health records or electronic medical records, whatever your term you prefer, is that through this means, this will be able to provide not only better communication of information um, to health care providers, but it also enables um, with patient health records, so to speak, it allows you to communicate with your patient um, and assure that they have information and that there's a, a two-way exchange. So again, the third C here is that it's important to have good communication. And lastly, in terms of the fourth C, document, actually, what do you think? But carefully document in the patient's records uh, because 
um, this is one of the most significant areas in that documentation is inadequate. One of the basic uh, tenets in terms of uh, an adverse event, um, if it's not documented in terms of what you did or did not do, then it did not occur. So one of the key areas in which you can um, minimize your risk um, and fulfill your requirements is to carefully document um, the patient's records in terms of, you know, what had occurred and what you did or what took place uh, prior to or after, you know, this uh, adverse event. Also, in terms of a, a facility or program or entity, risk management needs to be discussed in terms of a culture. And it needs to start at the top. It needs to start at the top and go all the way down to the bottom. What I mean, it needs to start with either your parent organization, your top executive, administrative staff, whatever you want to call them, right down to your front line staff. If you have security staff, if you have receptionists, if you have support staff, all need to be involved in some aspect of risk management. We're going to discuss this in the next module. Um, so again, it starts at the top, but it goes throughout the organization. It's important to have key personnel in charge, and we'll talk more about this as well. You need to have a structure to your program, um, and it needs to be, you know, designated staff that are involved. You need to have training and reinforcement of uh, rules and guidelines related to risk management uh, for all of your uh, staff, your clinical staff, and the entire staff. You can't avoid risk, but you can manage it. You need to strive to provide top quality clinical care and pay close attention to what we call the best uh, risk management tenets as they've been outlined or will be outlined. And uh, you need to make this really a source of pride for your organization in that you really recognize what risk management is about and you're fully committed to it. Okay, that ends our first module that I'm presenting today and I'm going to go on to module two. I think I just have it here. Yeah, here we go. We're going to talk more about managing risk. Um, let me go to the slide check. Okay. Now, what is risk management? Let's look at some uh, what I call definitions. Um, from a traditional or basic sense, what we're talking about here is the process of analyzing your exposure to risk and defining how best to handle that exposure. Um, you know, in terms of insurance risk management, it's focused on uh, pure risk. And we're not talking about, you know, like uh, accidental loss of because the business, you know, was a bad business decision to go into this type of care or whatnot. We're talking about, you know, specifically um, events and so forth, not from the overall business perspective. In terms of uh, looking at yourself as a healthcare entity, um, because, you know, risk management involves many other types of business, the financial business, uh, all kinds of businesses. It's just not related to health care. Uh, it's an organized effort to identify, to assess, to reduce where appropriate risk to patients. Uh, think of yourself, think of your program, visitors to your program, staff, and any of your organizational assets. It's a program designed to reduce the incidence of preventable, preventable accidents and injuries to minimize the financial loss to the institution uh, should an injury or what we call an adverse event or accident occur. Now here's a reference and I've listed it at the bottom which I really liked in terms of some analysis. Uh, progressive steps what in for a healthcare setting uh, in terms of risk management as a process. Uh, the 5 I system by Borlando to investigate. Here he's talking about observe or study by examination 
and systematic inquiry in terms of your program to inform, to present inf information, to present in material form information, actually, um, and influence to affect or alter by indirect or intangible means, uh, to explain or tell the meaning of or present in understandable terms, interpret, and lastly, to integrate to form or blend into a whole and to unite with something in terms of, and here we're talking about integrating within the entire entity of your uh, OTP or organization. Further, he states, what is the mission of risk management? It is to select, coordinate, and efficiently apply interdisciplinary skills to harmful uncertainties which may diminish the future value of public or private or personal resources. It's a broad definition. And in terms of uh, a general strategy, he recognizes what we call the big A strategy. And what it means is anticipate. You need to anticipate what could go wrong, and you need to be prepared to handle that possibility. An example here is a penicil penicil analogy. Well, it's common practice to ask uh, at various points at intake or sometimes or during admission or um, throughout the course of treatment if a patient has an allergy to penicillin. Well, a patient may not recognize that and may say no and you prescribe it. You need to anticipate that that may be incorrect and be prepared to handle it in the event that a patient gets penicillin and has an adverse reaction. So. That's what we mean by being prepared to handle the possibility, even if it does go wrong. Here's another way of looking at um, risk management in terms of healthcare setting, in terms of areas of identification, analysis, uh, control, and treatment, and acceptance. Now, I want to go through these um, subsequently in detail, but think again. Uh, what we're talking about when we talk about risk identification. We're talking about collection of information about current and past patient occurrences and other events that could have potential loss to the institution. And there are a variety, and you can see there are antitrust violations, breach of contract, casualty exposure, defamation, fraud and abuse, general liability, and the list goes on, you can see. Uh, when we talk about there's a broad category of um, areas that uh, need to be identified. Risk analysis entails the evaluation of, again, repeating this, uh, past experience and current exposure to eliminate uh, or limit as much as possible uh, the impact of the risk. And here we're talking about patient care, be it direct or indirect, uh, if there's uh, in, uh, an event that may have a negative impact of, uh, upon the community related to, um, you know, activities involving your opioid treatment program. Uh, the, advent, the event may have an effect on your staff and their morale, uh, and the bottom line may be impacted in terms of cash flow. So you need to analyze your risk in terms of these regards. Risk control treatment here, we're talking about the organization's response to a significant risk or areas um, as it's a rejoinder to limit the liability associated with incidents that have occurred. Um, most common, this is the most commonly associated function with um, risk management program is the control and the treatment of the risk. Now let's look at some methods and techniques, and I have some scenarios or examples that, you know, they're, they're not all in inclusive, but you can relate to in terms of what do we mean by risk assessment, exposure avoidance, loss prevention, loss reduction, exposure segregation, and contractual transfer. These are all elements or methods or techniques of uh, you know, your risk management strategies may involve a combination. It's not necessarily a single activity, but it's just to give you somewhat of a primer or a background information in terms of how risk management strategies are developed from, you know, the perspective or angle of 
of looking at well, what's the technique involved here. When we talk about risk assess, uh, acceptance, uh, let's look at this issue that essentially this means that the facility decides not to purchase insurance against a uh, specific adverse event because when you look at the risk, it cannot be avoided, reduced, or controlled. In addition, the probability of the loss is not great and the potential for fiscal consequences uh, for the facility, uh, you know, can be resolved. So what's the scenario? What am I talking about here? Well, if you use this um, technique or strategy, what we're saying here is that the advent, uh, we're looking at possibly in terms of a scenario, an adverse event uh, involving a neighbor, uh, neighboring business. What if, if you're in an urban area or an area where, you know, there's a busy highway and maybe um, the business across the street is, uh, has a fire and it's burned down and traffic is obstructed, uh, you necessarily may not involve, uh, you know, be involved with purchasing insurance to protect yourself from that because you can't necessarily control that and you can't reduce it, you can't transfer it. And yes, there may be some impact, but it's not significant impact and you can resolve it. Or, you know, you may have a weather-related event such as a snowstorm, you know, uh, aside from, you know, uh, a, a very serious event such as, you know, 50 inches of snow, um, and I, I'm not sure if you can even purchase insurance for that, but again, you can't control that. Yes, there may be some potential fiscal consequences, but, you know, it will resolve or, you know, you have some capacity to resolve it. And again, the analogy here is a tropical storm, not a full-blown Category 5 uh, hurricane, again, but again, the, em the emphasis here is that the probability of loss is not great in terms of the an analogies or uh, uh, scenarios that I presented, and there is some capacity uh, here to resolve the issue. Let's look at what we call by exposure avoidance. Um, a consultant who was providing um, advice or uh, services to a hospital for risk management did an assessment, and after he did his assessment, he advised a major liability loss was the emergency room. So he recommended to avoid the liability by eliminating the emergency room. Here, the aim is to rid the institution of service, the emergency service personnel or equipment that may cause the loss and uh, never to, you know, here, not to be involved in providing the service at all in that entity. And you've seen this issue of hospitals closing their emergency rooms, and sometimes it's more likely related to financial risks or financial issues, but also the liability um, is a factor. Now, in terms of our topic today and looking at the issue of an opioid treatment program, you know, I think a common scenario might be that, you know, there are some opioid treatment programs that provide medical care on site at the clinic, but you need to accept the liability for that. So if you want to avoid the liability, you de decide not to provide uh, medical care, uh, you know, on site at your clinic. You, you get rid of the risk by, you know, not exposing yourself to that. Let's look at loss prevention in terms of analysis. Using early detection here, you look at your records, your incident reports, complaints, billing practices. You're looking to pinpoint potential loss prevention areas. Um, some of these losses for specific services can be prevented by, you know, revising or, or having involvement of what we call educational programs. Um, and keeping the patient fully informed of all mishaps. Um, here, the analogy I'm using is: what if you know? What if you're focusing upon medication errors uh, for dosing, you know, particularly of methadone? You again, going back to our uh, analogy here. Uh, if you looked at your records, you may look that there was a medication error involving a patient, and you know, and this depends upon how your program is established and how you know, the physical plan and, and so forth and how things are set up. There may be an incident that involves um, a patient getting a wrong medication, but it was related to uh, the need to redesign your program, you know, the dispensing area, the dispensing line, 
uh, protocols involving the medical staff and making sure that the correct patient is identified and given the correct dose uh, and other you know issues such as security uh, and management of the entire process of the um, dosing area uh, so that you know patient only uh, restrict it's restricted to patients who are actively getting their medication and it's not trafficked by other patients or staff so that there's confusion so uh, if we go back to the issue of uh, modifying uh, involvement of the medical staff and ancillary staff in some kind of educational or program activity and to instituting uh, preventative measures to uh, prevent the loss and having uh, this adverse event. Let's look at another example of reduction. Well here um, what we're talking about is usually it usually involves the management of claims uh, in terms of records and that they're maintained and preserved. Uh, if you have uh, an event of loss, um, settlements and say for instance you settle related to this loss uh, or release information, then your loss reduction efforts are stopped. Uh, the aim here is to control adverse events by focusing on activities such as staff education or revisions of policies and procedures. This is a classic example of what I call, uh, well, what if you have a claim related to wrongful death? And, you know, programs have had these at times. And the effort here is to focus on assuring that the records are per, uh, preserved, that they're not tampered with or altered in any way uh, so that, you know, when you deal with this claim that you can be prepared, prepared to uh, uh, present the information that is required in the event that you have, you know, that this claim does come forth. And if you need to, you need to have your, act your staff actively involved in knowing, you know, what's, what needs to take place in terms of, of making sure that um, information is maintained um, to uh, manage this uh, claim. Another technique or strategy would be considered how, uh, exposure segregation. And here, uh, looking at this analogy of uh, the hospital setting, um, often they decide to what we call separate out or duplicate specific, and the word here, I've changed offending, but this is how this was stated. But I would say the targeted service or personnel or activities identified as risk exposure. What is intended here is intensive control actions to segregate your exposure. And a common example here that was noted is a hospital may want to control uh, or, or segregate um, pharmacy services to a central area so that they can reduce the uh, incidence of medication error, errors. Now, I can see this in terms of an opioid treatment program. Um, looking at this element uh, in terms of what we call special populations for women, parenting, or pregnant women, or women with children. You know, some programs who have a large or significant population of female patients with children or parenting women or pregnant women either have a separate program um, or have uh, another area of their program um, for patients with, you know, these needs because there is a certain risk of exposing um, pregnant women and women with children to the general population. It gives you the ability to provide more intense and specialized services. So that's a scenario that I could see in terms of exposure segregation. You separate out or you duplicate and the targeted service, um, et cetera, for the, and personnel and activities to uh, minimize, again, your risk for an adverse event or um, your in a, to impair your ability to provide quality care. And the last strategy that we're talking about here is uh, a facility or provider to transfer or shift the risk to the organization that provides the service or the entity through insurance or through a contract. Again, you're trying to avoid liability loss. Um, and here the facility may 
still be responsible for selecting a qualified contract or if you contract out. And I thought of a very common scenario in relation to this is that uh, providers, not only OTPs or opioid treatment programs, often have independent contractors, such as a psychologist for psychological testing. Well, again, the point is you're transferring the risk, shifting the risk to that independent contractor um, through, an, you know, their personal insurance or whatever. But nonetheless, it's not you're avoiding some risk, but it may not be fully uh, avoidable because you may still be at some risk because you have to demonstrate you have a qualified contractor, however that's defined. So again, these are just examples of the uh, six areas of risk management or risk control and treatment. Let's look at it from another perspective in terms of a cycle because uh, I'm emphasizing here that risk management is a continuous process. It's not a just a you know, one-stop thing. It starts out with uh, your opioid treatment program defining the scope and frame framework of your strategy. It should be a priority. It involves assessment, identifying risk, and analyzing, evaluating risk. And I think we've talked extensively about, you know, some of the measures uh, in terms of control and uh, treatment and options uh, in terms of accepting, exposure, avoidance, prevention, reduction, and uh, exposure segregation and transfer. And then there needs to be communication throughout the opioid treatment in terms of monitoring and continuous review. Again, let's focus on the strategy from the framework standpoint. Is it a priority for your opioid treatment program? It should be if it isn't. And then who within that opioid treatment program has involvement with your risk management strategy or program? And what resources do you have available to the program and to the risk management activities. In terms of assessment, we've talked about some of these areas. In terms of identification, uh, analyzing and evaluating risk, it should be a comprehensive approach. You know, identifying risk, looking for loss and areas of exposure. Look at your policies, your procedures, and utilize multiple sources, not just one, of information. And it should involve all staff and we, in some capacity, and I point out it should be top down. Uh, you should have some means of looking at what we call critical or adverse events uh, that happen in terms of uh, patient care and, and various issues. And red flags should be um, readily identified. You know, if something is highly unusual, it should be earmarked should look at patient complaints and look at any advisory and uh, be aware of any advisory bulletins such as the, uh, not frequent, but the letters that come from SAMHSA, the Dear Colleague letters that alert uh, you about a certain area of concern or activity. These should be incorporated. Look at your risk and look at the frequency, the likelihood that it would happen, the severity. And most lastly, what is the impact that this would happen, I mean, that this would uh, cause if this risk should occur or a certain risk should occur. And then evaluate your options in terms of the worst that could happen, the minimal, and then what would be the cost to the opioid treatment program. Again, in terms of risk control treatment options, we've talked about these methods or techniques. And it should not be reviewed, as I put it, as a single formal process. It can be overlap and variation of all of these elements. Your risk management activities, it's a good idea to have collaboration with your safety management. Many uh, OTPs or programs have safety committees, you know, with various titles and so forth. And the other area that risk management should be tied to or collaborated with is quality assurance or quality improvement. Uh, because if you have this, then you have a very good approach and comprehensive uh, method. Areas of potential uh, liability problems involve obviously bodily injury, wrongful death, uh, program liability, property loss, and you know other consequential uh, consequential losses related to an event.
Lastly, communication throughout the opioid treatment program. We talk about monitoring and continuous review. Active involvement of all staff at some level. Um, it's a good idea to have staff development and training activities. Um, it's also good to assign function or duties to various staff persons, uh, you know, departments within your opioid treatment program, and have written policies and procedures uh, that are in place. There should be a formal structure. You should have a designated committee or task force or whatever you want to call it. But you need to have this. They need to have regular meetings. And the activities need to be documented and recorded. You need to collect data and information and act upon it uh, appropriately. OK, moving right along here. I think we're coming up to the last. Let's see, module, I don't know. Up there, here we go. And then we'll have um, time for questions. We're going to talk about in module three, again, this is our introductory module to effective risk management strategies. Uh, let's look a little closer at the relationship between risk and practices in um, opioid treatment programs. The standard of care uh, from an ideal sense, and I believe this was taken from uh, a risk management strategy from CSAT, uh, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Treatment in 2005, but again, it's good information. From admission, each patient receives individualized care, that assessment and treatment is ongoing, and it's well documented. You need to have confident staff, and we could spend considerable time talking about this. What do you mean by confident staff? They really need to have knowledge of this area of expertise or treatment. If you have uh, staff that has no prior experience in a specialized area of opioid addiction treatment, you know, one can question the competency. And that means that goes from the medical staff to the counseling staff as well. They need to be competent and knowledgeable about the specifics of opioid uh, treatment involving methadone in particular. And if they do not have this, that needs to be addressed. They need to have education and training about this. You need to exercise good clinical judgment in terms of clinical practices, which are published um, and, and available. And you need to incorporate what we call evidence-based or best practices in terms of your overall approach to uh, treatment. When you understand your risks and understand your strategies, you can have an effective risk management program. The two go together. It's important to really understand what your core liabilities are. And I think we've talked about this in other segments, but we're driving home. And there is benefit to repetition, document, document, document. It's important to document as completely as possible your uh, involvement with the patient and patient care and all activities related to that. Uh, many claims are successfully won because the documentation was very poor. The information that was needed was not there, and claims are won uh, primarily because of this, this central issue. Another is communicating the risks uh, that are involved. We'll talk about that. Review and correct. Uh, consider what's reasonable and foreseeable. In other words, what would a reasonable clinician or physician do, uh, you know, and foresee in terms of, you know, what is available in terms of what's going on with the patient, what's happening, or what you um, uh, consider to be potential, a potential problem or could see as a problem. You need to assess for impairment. And in, mo in uh, not module, but in our second training, we will have an extensive discussion about dealing with this significant area of, of impairment, as I mentioned early on, uh, compared to an analysis of claims, you know, previous claims maybe 10, 20 years ago or so, 
in the last five, ten years, there are more and more claims related to impaired drivers and in this issue of impairment. impairment. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about, in detail, about minimizing your risk, uh, ways and strategies to look at uh, assessing and, and monitoring patients for being impaired while in opioid treatment program. And if it sounds unusual or is a possible red flag, you need to attend to uh, those indicators. So if you look at all of these, you can minimize your risk uh, by addressing this, and your liability is related to failure to do all of these. We're going to briefly touch on the issue of informed consent uh, today. And we're going to focus more in our next module about, or our next training rather, about uh, informed consent. Uh, it really needs to be, consent needs to be informed and voluntary. And a simple signature of the patient is not informed consent. There is a process involved, and I'm going to spend considerable time in our next training talking about this. And uh, this is one of Lisa's favorite areas to talk about assuring that the patient is truly informed, and we'll have some discussion about uh, phase informed consent and uh, in detail. Informed consent for opioid treatment programs in terms of, a, in terms of uh, the basic areas, basic, they, patients need to understand what we're talking about, the basic science of addiction. And we're talking about not a full-blown course in addiction medicine, we're talking about their understanding that addiction is a brain disease. You know, we're, I'm really talking about the medical model, uh, that it's not a moral issue, and that treatment is effective, and so forth. They need to have an understanding of that. And we'll spend some time talking about that. Methadone treatment, they need to know specifically what the risks are. Uh, we're going to talk extensively about, you know, educating patients about the risk of taking other medications, you know, the problems with benzodiazepines, uh, not informing, uh, you know, other providers and uh, such as, you know, their family physicians, psychiatrists. They go to the hospital. They, many times the patient will not even tell, you know, the emergency room staff that they're taking methadone. So they need to know the risk involved of this treatment. They need to understand fully the benefits of, of treatment of methadone and what it's really intended to do. And tied with this is the importance of staying in treatment for what I call an adequate length of time or what we call in medicine therapeutic trial. You know, we need to educate patients that this is not a quick fix. You just don't start this treatment and end it, you know, in a couple of months. It's really a long-term strategy. It does not necessarily mean for the rest of their life, but it may. And it's okay for them to stay in treatment indefinitely if they are benefiting from it. And lastly, programs need to look at alternatives. If a patient is more appropriate for an alternative medication, such as buprenorphine or suboxone or naltrexone, we need to discuss that with them. You know, not too often uh, patients get referred for alternative therapies when it truly is indicated. So. They need to, we need to make sure that we provide what the alternative uh, to methadone treatment is, specifically, like I said, other medications. Um, and if it's really appropriate for this patient to, to be referred to what we call either drug-free or maintenance-free treatment, uh, the patient needs to understand this in terms of their consent. Lisa says the right thing to do is phased informed consent. New information provided throughout all phases of treatment. Multiple consent, verifying ongoing sense of treatment as new uh, phases progress. That's the process. It's like it's continuous. It's not just, you know, when they come in and they sign that initial uh, SAMHSA uh, recognized, so to speak, uh, consent to treatment and that's it. No. That's one part, but there needs to be multiple consents related to various activities, you know, involving the uh, program and their process of treatment, and it should be uh, continuous.
when you provide appropriate consent, it may, and I really think I've seen this to be effective, it increases the patient's motivation to be involved in treatment. And some recognize that, you know, these phase forms of consent helps to transfer or share the risk with the patient. What we mean by that is you're holding the patient accountable for, you know, their treatment and activities involving it. And I think the more that you do, uh, the better the outcome. You get what we call patient buy-in. Um, another advantage of having what we call phase uh, informed consent is throughout the patient, uh, the course of the patient's treatment, it provides you with the ability to understand the patient's comprehension uh, related to treatment and to assess and observe if this patient is really confident in terms of their ability to continue with treatment. Um, uh, Lisa previously pointed to the analogy that, you know, patients are often anxious to get into treatment and they'll sign anything because they want to get started on their dose and so to speak and they're anxious and they may not fully understand. So you need to take time to see that they really understand and that they comprehend that this is, this is a serious commitment to treatment. It, it can be challenging, but it can be done. And this gives you the ability to observe, you know, the patient's level of understanding uh, and competency. There are risks that are associated at admission. You know, the patient is really, in many cases, unknown, the majority to you. And the history and information that they provide can be unreliable. The patient's response to methadone will be variable. Not every patient will have the same response. And you need to individualize your protocols and treatment for that. And then also during this admission process, the patient may not adhere to your treatment recommendations or your management. Patients may not come daily for their dosing. They'll skip days. They'll take other medications. They won't give you, uh, you know, full uh, information that you need to take care of them adequately. So these are the risks that you more or less have to recognize and accept. Integrating the patient's family or significant other uh, in the treatment is valuable. However, it may be very challenging because many of our patients, uh, you know, are stigmatized and excommunicated, so to speak, from their families. Um, so that may be challenging, but you need to invite families to participate in the patient's treatment and have the patient sign a release so that you can openly communicate and don't get into these uh, problems with violations of confidentiality. And in this uh, integration of the family, in terms of your risk management strategy, I pointed out the issue of educating the family, particularly during the induction phase, about the warning signs of a potential overdose because this is a significant area that needs to be addressed in terms of preventing uh, wrongful deaths because the family wasn't aware that there was risk involved in the, or that there were warning signs, so to speak, that the patient was being over-medicated or taking other medications. and They may have done uh, something that could have prevented uh, the patient's death. We're going to talk about impairment. This is a severe risk of exposure and as I pointed out, trends show impairment as an increasingly likely factor in more of the claims that are being filed by opioid treatment programs. What are some areas in terms of high risk for impairment, the induction process? We'll talk about that subsequently. Drug-drug um, interactions with methadone, illicit drugs, and prescribed drugs, particularly benzodiazepines and sedatives hypnotic class of drugs. Um, as here I'm pointing out other hypnotic medications such as or muscle relaxants such as uh, carisoprodol, also known as soma, um, alcohol in combination with uh, methadone and cocaine can have um, serious adverse consequences and can be potentially lethal. You can't bury your head in the sand. You must. You have a duty to take action, you have a duty to warn. And in summary, you can't ignore, again, I emphasize strongly here, you have a duty to warn, um, and you need to make reasonable inquiry and to do uh, assessment. You need to 
uh, have what we call informed consent, and ideally it needs to be phased and continuous throughout treatment. And I can't drive home enough that in the patient's course of treatment throughout, from beginning to end, you need to document, document, document. Okay, I thank you. And if we have, I believe we have about 20, 30, 25 minutes for questions, if there are any. And if you uh, want to review this material, it will be available subsequently uh, to my presentation. I believe Chris will give you instructions how you can get the slides and any information that you need. And if there are questions and information that you want further, uh, the last slide has my contact information in my email address. Thank you. Dr. Taylor? Yes. Okay. Uh, there was only yes. one there was only one question that came through and that was really I think in, based on the first set of slides. Um, what was the question? Well, it was, uh, you were discussing um, information from a statistical analysis, and they just want to know why Puerto Rico wasn't included. Well, I'm going by, uh, first of all, I, you know, I apologize for that, but I'm going by the data that was presented from the national, uh, or what they call vital statistics website. And this is data that they collect. It's not data that I collected. So, you know, I didn't see Puerto Rico listed as well. And I, I had that question. So I'm not sure why, but I got the um, data from, I think the slide lists the national, uh, what is it, vital statistics. You can go on their website and they give you this information. But I can't honestly say why Puerto Rico. But when I saw that I would ha I had uh, in my audience uh, people from the, Caribbean, uh, Caribbean um, ATTC, I said, oh, I wonder if I could get that data, but it wasn't available. Okay. Perhaps if you know a way that, you know, I'd be happy to present that. Okay. Um, regarding the patient statistics on methadone-associated deaths, how did these numbers compare to OTP patients in general who do not die? No, what deaths, are they talking about the uh, 406 patients? I I'm not, think so. You think so? Yeah, I think so. Gail, you can, um, yes, she is. Well, again, this was data that um, Jane Maxwell presented at the reassessment in 2010, and it was based on, uh, let me make this clear, it was based on data from a single year in 2009. In other words, the report that they got from SAMHSA, you know, the mortality report. When you have a patient who dies in your opioid treatment program, irrespective of that death, SAMHSA is now asking OTPs to submit a report. Was it an overdose or, you know, based on the data that you collect? So I can't say in that sense that, and what uh, Jane did, she looked at all of the reports for that year. And it was, again, a small sample of 406 patients. And you can see, uh, you know, through the slides what the breakdown was. So in answer to your question, you know, I think it can't be answered at this point because there are, what, about 1,200 opioid treatment programs in the United States, and I believe in, that includes Puerto Rico. I'm not sure. And they're in excess of 200, maybe 80,000 patients in opioid treatment program. So I think you can do the math, so to speak. But keep in mind what this represents. For one single year in 2009, SAMHSA received 406 reports. And what SAMHSA is hoping is that as we communicate and get this information out to improve our ability to answer that question, we need all programs to participate and report deaths to uh, SAMHSA, as is, is not presently required, but it may be in terms of, you know, your accreditation standards in the future. I'm not trying to frighten anybody, but that may be the issue, that it may be required as a, an accreditation standing from CARF or JACO or whatever 
that will show me that you reported all your deaths to uh, SAMHSA. This way it gives us the ability to answer this question and to look at this issue of uh, mortality related to methadone and to really um, answer the question and substantiate that the deaths are not coming from opioid treatment programs, but they're coming from entities in the area of pain management, pain management clinics, physicians who, are, who have switched from prescribing uh, other opioids such as oxycodone and, and so forth, oxycontin. You remember we had the epidemic of oxycontin and um, what happened was uh, many pain uh, entities or programs switched from prescribing oxycontin to methadone. And there's a difference in the pharmacology between these two drugs and this subsequently, you know, had an impact and some of the mortality was traced to that. So again, in answer to the question about the deaths involving overall in terms of opioid uh, treatment programs, the information is evolving. And the more we participate and give data to uh, SAMHSA, we'll be able to get a better picture on this. For example, I remember, I, I don't have it exactly, but in terms of my program, my pro, I have two sites and we have about 600 and some odd patients and I believe for last year we had overall about eight or nine deaths in our program. However, I think we only had one patient who was, was an overdose and this patient uh, was technically still in treatment but had been absent for about 14 days. Of the other seven or eight to nine uh, patients that died, they all died from uh, other disorders, liver disease, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, HIV AIDS. So again, you know, the data from my pro program pretty much parallels, um, you know, the information that has been uh, presented. So if you're not participating in the online uh, reporting to SAMHSA, I encourage you to do so because the more we collect data, the better this picture can be uh, understood or identified. Uh, Are there any other questions? Do you Hello? have statistical data comparing death rates as well with buprenorphine treatment? No, I think it's a little too early. There are some data, um, and I believe SAMHSA is in the process of looking at that. But bear in mind, you know, the numbers may be small because of the length of time that uh, Suboxone and, and Subutex, buprenorphine, has been available. So I think that picture is evolving. But, you know, there is some data, but you can't compare it to methadone because we've been using methadone for treatment for 40 years and, you know, it's been a little under or over 10 years that we're using, uh, or, yeah, a little under, it's under 10 years that we're using Suboxone. Okay. Um, well, that's it for the questions um, for you that looks like somebody did ask about CEUs and I will just say that for people who watch all three portions of this one training, uh, those people will be able to get CEUs. And I'll email more about that to all the attendees. Um, so I guess that's it for this session. And um, people can watch their email for the link to uh, part two. They don't have to re-register. So uh, just look for that. And we will also send you the PowerPoints from today's session as well. So thank you for joining us. And we will end this now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Taylor, thanks a lot. I'm going to hang up now. Okay, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.